Seeking God reveals the mind of Christ. Now Philippians 2.5 tells us this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. But he says, let, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we, God wants us to have the mind of Christ. So we should have it, right? We can all say that that's, a, that's an amen moment. We should have the mind of Christ. If you look at the last verse in chapter 2, right where we are, the last verse, it says this. For who has known the mind of the Lord, verse 16, that he may instruct him? But then he says, but we have the mind of Christ. He says, we have it. You, when you're born again, you have the mind of Christ. Because Christ is in you and you are in Christ. So if we have the mind of Christ, and I even asked uh, Sister Yvonne the other day, if we have the mind of Christ, are we thinking like Christ? Are we talking like Christ? Are we walking like Christ? And I can't remember it because she was like kind of like yes and no, kind of. And that's a, and that's a perfect answer because sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. And so what God wants us to do is to develop our mind to be Christ-like. You know what the word Christian means? The word Christian means Christ-like. We're supposed to be like Christ. A lot of times people use that word Christians to associate the religion. Like I'm a Christian instead of this, that, or the other. But if they say to me, I'm a Christian, I'm looking to see whether they're like Christ. I'm looking to see whether they're talking like Christ walking like Christ, acting like Christ, have mercy like Christ, loving like Christ. I'm looking for those, those attributes, amen? Because that's, even though we might not be there, that's what we're struggling, you know, what we're trying to get to. We want to grow every day, right? Look at what it says here in chapter 1. I want to pick up in verse 30 alone. It says, but of him, chapter 1, 1 Corinthians, verse 30, but of him, you are in Christ, Jesus. And I, I love this. Who became for us wisdom. Christ became wisdom. Christ became uh, righteousness. Christ became sanctification. And Christ became redem redemption for us. But then he says, you are in Christ. So guess what? Now you should be walking in wisdom having insight, understanding of the knowledge of his will. Amen? We should be walking in righteousness, right? Which is, means that we're justified. Because of Christ, we now are the, considered the just. We now are, are considered uh, uh, no longer, you know, uh, what do you call it? Irrepute, irrepute, irrepute or something like that. But no longer Gentiles. See, we were Gentiles, but when you got born again, we became saints, which moves me to number three. He says, Christ became sanctification. Sanctification is holiness. It means to be set apart. So Christ was set apart because he was, you know, holy. God is holy. Amen. But so are we. See, the thing that gets me is when you're born again, you have now been justified, right? You have now been set apart. You are now considered holy, which is why God calls us saints. Amen? Now, can you be a saint and a sinner at the same time? No. You can be a saint because you're, that's your new nature. Who sinned? Amen? Yes, yes. You can be a saint and still stumble and still make mistakes and still struggle with whatever. It could be an, and it could be an addiction. But yes, you can still uh, sin. But that's not who you are. Who you are is a saint. You are a child of God. You are holy. God calls us a peculiar, pe a peculiar people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. That's who we are. So if, let me give you a, a scenario like this. If I'm a thief, I'm labeled a thief. That's who I am. That means that's what I do. Not that I stole one time, but this is my life. If I'm an alcoholic, that's what I do. I don't do it one drink and I'm done. I do it over and over and over again. So I get a label of that's who I am. But when you're born again, you are a saint. 
That's who you are. You are now holy. And now you have a whole new nature. And God says, because of your new nature, guess what? You have the last part of this, which is redemption. Redemption means you have been redeemed, which means you have been bought and paid for, which means you are now saved by grace through faith. His grace, our faith. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How will they call on him and whom they've not believed? How will they believe in him and whom they've not heard? How will they hear unless a preacher? How can one preach unless he is sent? Oh, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. God says, what it is is, and we talked about this last week, you all, remember I said, welcome to what? Y'all remember? Your church. Ah, no, no, no. Welcome to your ministry. Your ministry. I know that was good though. <laughs> but it's your ministry because all of us, when you're born again, become representatives of God. And he says, I've given you the ministry of reconciliation. So now we're supposed to go forth and serve. Amen? But this is who we are now. Amen? So what does God want us to do with the mind of Christ? How can we, if he says that you have the mind of Christ, but yet we don't know some things, why? Well, let's look back at chapter 2, verse 9. It says, but as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Right? So you would say, well, you know, he says right here, I haven't seen it, I haven't heard it, and I can't really understand it in my heart because I just don't know. Right? But then, if you look at verse 10, that kind of disqualifies that. Because it says, but God has done what? Has revealed it. So God has given us where we're to see, to hear, and to understand. So why are we not hearing? Why are we not seeing? And why are we not understanding? It's because the first part of this message says, seeking God, right, reveals the mind of Christ. Seeking God reveals the mind of Christ. The Bible tells us that if you seek him diligently, you will find him. The Bible tells us, uh, 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 seek him while he's near. Draw near to him, and he'll draw near to you. But he gives us, he gives us these opportunities saying, seek me, and you'll get all the answers. You'll get all, look, look, it says, no eye has seen the things which God has prepared. There's a lot of things that God, some glorious things, some awesome things that God says, you know, I've already told you, I've already shown you, and I've, but you just can't see it yet because I need you now to start seeking me at another level. I need you to start, you know, praying a little bit more. Not, not a long prayer, just a right prayer. What's a right prayer? A right prayer is from the heart. Simple. It's just, Lord, I don't know. Or, Lord, I need you to help me. Something that is from the heart, and if that's from the heart, God's standing back saying, I was just waiting for you to open your mouth and ask me for help. And now that you ask me, yes, I'm going to begin to do some things. The Bible says he works all things together for the good of those who love him. You notice how he keeps tying that love thing in there? He works all, that's Romans 8, 28. He says, and God works all things, all things, your mistakes, right? Your, your, your shortcomings. Even your, your, your direct, you know, uh, uh, obedience. Everything, God says, I work everything together for the good of those who love me and those who are the called. Only two requirements. Do we love God? Yes. Are we called? Yes. He just said it right here. He says, those, those, the ones that I call, right, are not the ones that you think I should call. That's why I said, God's got a twisted way of looking at things because he's like, no, no, I'm going to take the weak things. I'm going to take David, who's a shepherd boy, out in the field of tending sheep, when his brothers are standing head and shoulders above him, looking good, strong, physical stature. I'm going to take not those boys. I'm going to take the little, ruddy shepherd boy. And I'm going to make him a king. And, and out of him come going to come the genealogy where Jesus will come through his seed. I'm going to take the weak things, the, the things that look like they can't work. 
Anybody in here like me? <laughs> Hang on, let me finish the question. Anybody in here shy like me? Amen. I see your hands. Amen. 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 Now, you all need to know, and Yvonne can tell you, I'm the youngest of five brothers and sisters, the shyest of the bunch. Amen. God called me to preach. Come on. Come on. Does that make sense? No, but see, what happens is, if I can take somebody who's shy, who don't want to be in front of anybody talking about anything, and then put my spirit in him, and give him a focus and a purpose for his life to stand and proclaim the gospel, and knowing that it's not depending on him, but he has to depend on me, if I can do that with him, then that's a testimony to anybody else that I can do it with them. And trust me, I, my mom looked at it and said, it had to be God. <laughs> Only God could have done that. But he says, I take the, the weak things. I take the, the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Because the Pharisees would have thought that they were the chosen people, the, the ones walking around with the garments and the, the uh, ephod and the, the cross, the big cross, and not just the little cross, the big ones, right? Parading around. Surely we are the chosen and we're the holiest. And we're the righteousness of God. And God said to them, Woe unto you. You're like dead men bones on the inside. An empty tomb. Can you imagine telling a, 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 a pope or somebody like that? You're dead on the inside. They had to be, that's why they wanted to kill him. He didn't fit their agenda. He came in and was tearing tables up. Turning them over. But yet they allowed it. Because he says, my father's house is a house of prayer. And you turned it into a den of thieves. They didn't get it. So here's what I want to say to you. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has it entered the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Amen? Well, the, the, when you look at those things, those things are glorious things that God says, once you began to see me, you're going to get the door is going to open up to some wonderful things. And I don't mean material wonderful things. I'm talking about spiritual wonderful things. I'm talking about things that God will send in your life in a path that will have you go down a path that is going to be, as you're walking down that path, you're going to be blessed and you're going to be a blessing to others. Because that's really what it's all about. Everything he gives us is to be given. It's not for us to keep is for us to be a steward over so that he can use us to be a blessing to someone else. You with me? So what is it that the mind of Christ that we need is the most central and the most uh, principal thing? It's called wisdom. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 4. I shared this with other preachers and I said, you know what's really interesting about Proverbs 4 in uh, looking at verse 1 through 7? God didn't say love is the principal thing. He didn't say faith was the principal thing. He said wisdom is the principal thing. And I thought about that a while, and I'm like, well, why would wisdom be more than love or, or faith? And then it dawned on me, how do you know anything unless you have wisdom? The Bible says faith comes by what? Hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The word of God is what? The wisdom of God. So you can't even, your faith can't even develop unless wisdom is leading you. Because wisdom does what? Wisdom tells us what to do. See, you can have knowledge and understanding. We're going to look at that. Knowledge and understanding. Knowledge, I think I shared this with you, some of you all. Knowledge without understanding is strictly information. We were watching a movie the other day and this pastor was preaching and he says uh, he was rehearsing. And he was rehearsing his uh, memorizing the Bible. And another brother walked in and he says, wait, 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 oh my, i got to finish this verse. And he, he was memorizing that verse and he finished it. He said, okay, good. Almost there, brother, and I'm, I'm going to have this thing, I'm going to have this, this, this whole Bible memorized. And I thought to myself, and I think Yvonne said it too, there you go, memory. But what is it as far as understanding? Because you can memorize the Bible verbatim, but can you apply the understanding of what it means? Just remember, you can quote it and make, it, make yourself look good, but can you quote it and then share that meaning of what that scripture meant? So, so knowledge without understanding is strictly information. 
You got all the, the words here. But knowledge, I mean, but information, when you come with spiritual understanding, which is revelation or illumination, if you add the spiritual understanding with the information, it becomes knowledge. Because knowledge, the Greek word in there, that little first four letters is what? No. It's to know. Now I know what I'm saying. Now I know what it means. Because God spiritually, by the Spirit, searches the deep things of God and reveals to us. He says he's given us uh, uh, by his Spirit. So then you have knowledge, understanding, what's left? Wisdom. Now that you understand the Word of God, now that you know the Word of God, would it be wisdom if you don't do the Word of God? No. If the Bible tells me that if I believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and I confess him Lord and Savior, I will be saved. And I say, I believe it. I know it. I'm not going to do it. That means that wisdom stops right there because you didn't do what you know you should do. Wisdom says, if you know this, then do this. And when you do this, wisdom comes in. Wisdom makes us wise. Amen? Look at what it says here. Hear my children, verse 1 of chapter 4 of Proverbs. Hear my children, the instruction of a father. And give attention to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine. Do not forsake my law. When I was in my father's son, or when I was my father's son, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother, he also taught me and said to me, let your heart retain my words. Keep my commands and live. Get wisdom and get understanding. Uh, do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her. Her is, anytime you see she and her in Proverbs, it's talking about wisdom. Do not forsake her uh, and she will preserve you. Love her and she will keep you. Here it is. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get understanding. Wisdom. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. How do I get the mind of Christ? I have to start seeking God. Through prayer, through looking in his word and saying, Lord, help me to understand. I don't need to know the whole Bible. I just need to know what I'm reading. If I'm looking at Proverbs, and this is supposed to be a book of wisdom that Solomon wrote, it should give me something that's going to help me throughout my life. It says here, what? Verse 6, do not forsake her, and she will preserve you. Love her, and she will keep, and she will keep you. Amen? So some of the things that our eyes have not seen, some of the things our ears have not heard, some of the things that our hearts have not understood, it's all going to come when we begin to seek wisdom. Amen? So, how do we start? How do we start with wisdom? James chapter 1, verse 5 through 8. Now this is going to be a, a twofer. Uh, this is going to be a twofer, okay? Y'all hear me? A twofer? A twofer means I'm going to give you two things. One, I'm going to give you the blessing of, of, of getting and attaining wisdom. And two, I'm going to give you the warning of not doing it the right way. Because it will say it right here. Listen to this. James chapter 1. And uh, we're going to pick up in verse uh, 4, 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. How do you get wisdom? You ask. You just say, God, give me wisdom. Right? And look at what God says. Who gives to all liberally, which is, means free, and without reproach, and it will be given unto you. Or it will be given to you. But here's the warning. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive some things of the, from the Lord. I did something on purpose just now. I ain't hear no, no response. Yvonne, you should have got that. I'm going to read it again. Tell me if y'all hear what I said. For let that man suppose that he will receive some things from the Lord. Anything. Yeah. Yeah, that's the key. The key says, let not that man who doubts in his heart 
but, uh, 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 let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. That means not only are you not going to get wisdom, but anything else you might have asked for, he says, you're not getting that either. He says, I'm not giving you anything because you're double minded. Well, right, let me finish it. He says, for he is, verse 8, he is, double, he is a double minded man, unstable in all his ways. Double mindedness would be pretty much like God said in Revelation when he's talking about the seven churches. And he says to one church, he said, I wish you were cold or hot. But because you're neither cold nor hot, but you're lukewarm, I vomit you out of my mouth. Which means God, you know, vomit is what makes you sick. God, that's another way of God saying, you make me sick. And he's talking about because, you know, he says, if you're hot, I can use you because you're on fire for the Lord. If you're cold, that's good. At least I know where you are and I, I know what I got to do. But I'm not going to use you right away because I got to bring you in. But if you're hot and cold, today you're going out here praising the Lord. Tomorrow you're out there, you know, doing the sin thing that you're sliding, not just stumbling, you're sliding in the sin. And he says, I can't use you like that. You're double-minded. So wisdom, he says, if any man lacks wisdom, ask of God. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. As many as are mature, we're growing to maturity. I told you Purpose for Life, we challenge. You know, this, this is one of the things. We encourage, but we also challenge. Because we know the blessings that God has for every one of us. And all we ever have to do is step out by faith, even if it's a little scary. Remember, remember Peter stepped out on the boat and walked on the water? Do y'all know how he got back in the boat? How did he get back in the boat? Anybody remember? How? The Bible says Peter got out and he was walking on the water. And he looked and he saw the wind and the waves and they were becoming boisterous and he started like, took his eyes, basically what he did is he took his eyes off Jesus. But when he saw the wind and the waves, he began to sink. And the Bible says, and Jesus reached down and grabbed him. And I said, well, how did he get back in the boat though? And the people says, well, Jesus carried him in the boat. I said, it didn't say he carried him. I said, he reached down and grabbed him. Now, you're going to, and I told him, I said, and you're going to tell me that Peter without holding on to Jesus, was able to walk on water, but now holding on to Jesus, he can't walk back to the boat? I said, come on now. If he walked without Jesus, you know he can walk with Jesus. The Bible didn't say he carried. And my point was, that had to have been a moment that Peter just weren't using his head when he just, he just stepped out the boat. He saw Jesus, he says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. And Jesus said, come. He stepped right on out of the boat and started walking on the water. And then he looked around. And he said, Jesus said, oh, you of little faith. All right, so I'm leaving these three things. Here's what I want you to do. God wants us to glorify him. He, his desire, he wants, let me, let me back it up. He wants us to have the same mind in Christ that Christ has. He wants that for us. See, we want it, but he does too. That's why he gave wisdom freely, or he gives it to us freely. That's why he opens the door and says, I revealed this, this mystery to you because I want you to know. And the only way you got to get it now is just seek me. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 29 and 30. You can write this down. I can come back to it later. I mean, you can look at it later. But it's revoking Romans chapter 8. Verse 29 and 30, it says, For whom he foreknew. This is God talking about um, the plan of salvation and the people coming to be saved. He says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. He says, I brought you into this world so that when you got born again, you can start the process of being conformed or conforming to look like my son. The more you look like him, the more pleased I am. The more you grow in my word, and, and, and one of the best prayers is to pray God's word back to him. Now, you don't have to. You can use the principles. You know, like the Lord's Prayer, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. If you take the principles of that, that uh, uh, prayer, because a lot of times we start saying that prayer, and we do it too sometimes. 
But I try to tell them, like especially at communion, uh, when we say that, we're going to pray that. We're not just reciting the Lord's Prayer. Pray the Lord's Prayer. You know, we can do that. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Because everything that's in heaven is duplicated and replicated here on earth. All the way from the tabernacle, from the temple, from the, 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 all the tools that are in there, everything represents what it's supposed to look like in heaven. And so God says, as it is in heaven, I mean, as it is on, on earth, as it is in heaven. Amen? But he wants us to be like him. Okay, so here's the three things. So what do I need to do in order to seek God and walking with the mind of Christ? That's, you should have that in your uh, papers. Yeah, I always do this. I always look at that. Here's mine. Yvonne, can you grab me one of those uh, programs? Yeah. Thank you. So everybody should have this in your program. And it says, seeking God reveals the mind of Christ. And then it says, so how do I attain the mind of Christ? Number one, what does it say? Hang out with God. Spend time with Him. Right? Psalm 42. It says this. As a deer panteth. Or, I'm using King James. New King James. As a deer pants for the water of books, so pants my soul for you, O God. He's thirsting for God. But there's a reason why he goes into this. Listen, let's keep reading. My, thought, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God, he says. My tears have been my food day and night, while they continually say to me, where is your God? Somebody's mocking him. And the reason they're mocking him is because he has stepped away. This is the contemplation of the sons of Korah, a group of people that are like praise warriors. But they have stepped away because it says here in verse 4, When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. For I used to, which means I ain't doing it now. I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God. I used to go to church. I used to go to the temple. You know what I mean? And, and, and when I used to go, I went with a voice of joy and of praise with the multitude that kept a pilgrim's feast. He says, I was there for whatever reason. I stepped away, but now I'm hungry for that again. So now my soul, and I, I preached a message a while ago talking about my soul speaks for me. Because now his soul is speaking for him saying, as a deer pants for the water brook, oh my soul thirsts for the living God. So he is sharing that he used to be there and he's trying to get back there. What is he trying to get back to? Hanging out with the people of God and the presence of God. Look at chapter, uh, same thing, uh, verse 30, I mean, chapter 37, verse 3 and 4. It says, trust in the Lord, Psalm, Psalm chapter 37, verse 3 and 4. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the Lord and feed on his faithfulness. You can't feed on God's faithfulness if you're not hanging out with him. You can't feed on his faithfulness because if he's faithful, that means he's active in your life. And you're able to look and say, it's the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in his eyes, right? But he says, and feed on his faithfulness, right? Um, and here's the, here's the key scripture. You hear this all the time, don't you? Delight yourself also in the Lord. And he will give you what? The desires of your heart. Right? And he shall give you the desires of your heart. Do you know that God, when he says he will give you the desires of your heart, what he is saying is that because you trust in him, because you feed on his faithfulness, because you're hanging out with him, your desires switch up and transform to be his desires. So he will give you the desires of your heart because your desire that you might have had years ago of wanting to have, I don't know, a yacht, okay? Well, if that yacht is not going to glorify God, God's like, I'm, I'm going to say hold on to that for a moment. I'm not going to say no because I can see the end before the, you know, during the beginning. And the yacht can maybe glorify me once you get in the right position. But when you hang out with God, 
All you want to do is please him now. All you want to do is know him and grow in him and, have the, and spend that intimacy time that you have with him. Because the closer you get to God, the more blessed you are. The more you get to God, the more the God begins to show up in your life in every area, not just one area, on your job, amen, in your home, walking down the street in the grocery store, you won't be able to help just letting your light shine. You even got to say something sometimes. People will come up to you and say, you know, you just seem like you're happy all the time. You just seem like you got a joy. Yeah, it's the joy of the Lord. God has been so good to me. And you stop me because you got to test see where you are. Because if you say that and they're like, oh, I got stuff again. God says, cast not your pearls before swine. Don't continue. But if this is one that you, she just said that and you said, oh, it's the joy of the Lord. Really? You know, I really wanted to get back with God. Now you got a conversation. Now there's your opportunity. Now you can just share what God has done in your life. And that's when they start to be led. And, and God, is, God is the one, the Bible says, one plant, one waters. God brings the increase. You're the planter or the waterer. Amen? And then let's look at this. So, actually, let me stop there. Oh, yeah, there's one more. John chapter 15. And it reads this. Let's talk about spending time with God. John chapter 15, verse 28 and 20, I mean 26 and 27. But when the Helper comes, talking about the Holy Spirit, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me, Jesus says. And look into this, verse 27. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. These are the disciples that walk with Jesus. They spend time with Jesus. And he says, and because you've been with me, because you hung out with me, because you spent some time with me, God says, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, and that's going to be the power you need in order for me to go, or in order for you to go forth and be a witness unto me. Number two. So the first one is just hang out with God. Spend time, quality time with Him. Number two. Humble yourself. Huh? That's a hard one. Humble. I'm glad to see some brothers in the house. Amen? <laughs> the reason I say that is because uh, I was in prison ministry for nine years in Maryland. And I started off going in doing one-on-one -on -one counseling. And then the senior chaplain asked me because there's a difference between uh, correctional facility and jail. Correctional facility is where you're almost in between to life sentences. So you have those that might be spending, you know, up to two years in correctional facility. But then if they're not released, they go to the penitentiary. That's the 30, 20 years of life, whatever. But the jail is only for 30 to 60 days or 30 to 90 days and either they're released or they go to the correctional facility. So the senior chaplain asked me to go and hold services in the jail. So I went and I started holding services in the jail. And what I found is that both in the jail, men, both in the jail and in the correctional facilities, those men were more easier to give their lives to Christ than those who are out here walking around free. And the reason being, I believe, is because when you're there, you already know you done messed up so much. It's like, okay, all right, I need some help. And you don't mind humbling yourself because they'll teach you. They'll humble you in jail. Y'all know that, right? You, you don't have your own, you don't, you don't have your way to do what you want. They tell you when to get up. They tell you when to go to bed. They tell you when to, you know, go in your shell. Tell you how long you can go out. I mean, it's, it's, everything is like, you do what I say do. That's a humbling experience for a man. But that also gets them in a place where they can now hear from God. And so my second thing is, humble yourselves and acknowledge your need for his spirit. One of the things we just looked at, you don't have to go back there because we talked about it in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 29, or 30, where it says, he takes the foolish things of the world. He takes the weak things. He takes the, the things that you know, are not and make them become. Because God always uses the things that he will get glory. Because if he takes the things that you think we got it going on, and you then use God, if God uses you, people might think that was you. But when they know it, it had to have been God to do this, because I know you, you know what I mean? Then God gets glory. But I want to do I do want to take you to this one. This is uh, 1 Kings. Remember uh, King Solomon? And what did King Solomon do? Do you remember the first thing he did? Uh, before he became king? 
one of the things he did is chapter 3 of 1 Kings. One of the things King Solomon did, let me back up and just share with you. Solomon is David's son. David was a man after God's own heart. David was the first king that God chose, not the first king of Israel. The first king of Israel was Saul, King Saul. But the people chose King Saul. And the people chose King Saul because Saul was head and shoulders above all the other men. So Saul, 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 when he stood among the men, he's the only one that's like everybody can see who he is. And he was handsome. And he had it going on, built strong. So everybody says, that's the one we want to be our king because of the outward appearance. And they wanted, Israel wanted somebody to be representing them that looked the part, even though they had God. Now you tell me how crazy is that? And it broke God's heart. Because God says, give them a king. Give them what they want. But tell them what this king is going to do. And they told, Samuel went and told the people, we can give you this king, but he's going to take the best of everything from you. He's going to take all your good oxen. He's going to take your women and your men servants and going to make them slaves. He's going to do this, that, and the other. And they said, nevertheless, we'll take him as king. And it's like, are you crazy? You had God as your king. Never lost a battle. Now you want a man to represent you. God says, give them what they want. And, and told Samuel, they didn't reject you. Because he was Samuel was hurt. And God says, they didn't reject you. They rejected me. And he was hurt. So after Saul, God says, now I'm going to pick the one. I'm going to pick the king. And I'm going to pick the king that doesn't look like Saul. I'm going to pick a little small shepherd boy. Somebody that is going to give me glory because I'm going to use him. I'm going to use him to slay a Goliath. I'm going to use him when a bear and a lion come to take him. Take you one of the sheep, he'll go after that bear and a lion with just a stab and get the sheep back from the bear and the lion. I said this all the time, all the time. I was like, can you imagine the bear and the lion looking at him like, seriously, you got to come with me with this, this staff. And he took the lion and the bear back. Bear back, excuse me. But look at what it says. So Solomon became, uh, oh, was the, the son of David. And God said, David, because you were a man of war, you had blood on your hands. I can't use you, but I will use your son. Children, y'all hear that? I will use your son. Amen? Y'all, y'all, I had to stop and pause there for a moment because we got some parents and some children. I will use your son and daughters. Amen? And so he says, so, so King Solomon is now about to become king. And look at what he says in verse 7 of chapter 3. Now, and this is a prayer to God. He says, now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David. But I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to, to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that they may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? And the last thing it says, the, and the speech pleased the Lord. Because what he did was Solomon Though he's about to be king, he humbled himself and said, listen, I can't do this without you, God. I need you. I, look, this great people that are yours, you want me to lead? I don't even know how to go out or come in. I'm a little child. How can I do this? And the, the Bible says, and the, the thing pleased the Lord and said uh, that Solomon had asked this thing in verse 10. Then God said to him, because you have asked this thing, if any man lacks wisdom, do what? Ask. Solomon asked. He said, and because you have asked not, or because you have not asked for long life for yourself, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself and understand, or to understand, I mean understanding to discern justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart. So that there will be none like, the, so that there will, there has not been any like you before, before you, nor shall any be like you after you. God says, because you asked the thing that humbled yourself and shared the need for me to be involved to make it happen, this is where He wants for us. Number two, as we're seeking God, humble ourselves. 
Let them know how much you need him. In whatever, whatever area it is that we need, let them know. Because that's the thing that God will then respond because he's dead to hear. And God says, I'm no respecter of persons. One of the things that I always, I told you, I take God did his prayer to him. One of the things I tell him is that, God, you said you're no respecter of persons. You said you show no partiality. So what I see in the Bible when you bless Moses, when you bless David, when you bless uh, Samson, and all these people in the Bible, all this, you bless them, I can have the same blessings. And he says, sure, you do what they did. Operate by faith. Operate by obedience. Stay with me. Spend time with me like they did. Hunger for me. And yes, I will bless you just like any, anybody else because I don't show any partiality. Lastly, number three. Never stop seeking God or his will. Never stop seeking God or his will. This is a lifelong thing. Our discipleship will never end until Jesus comes back. And even then, there's going to be some things, some wondrous things that he's going to show us that we're going to behold. Amen? Uh, turn with me and we'll end it right there. Proverbs, let's go back to Proverbs. Chapter 8. And then we're going to jump right into Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 17 says, those, says this. I love those who love me. Y'all hear that? I love those. This is the book of wisdom. This is wisdom talking, by the way. And who is wisdom? Jesus became what? Wisdom for us. But he says here, I love those who love me. Verse 17, chapter 8 of Proverbs. I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently will find me. Those who seek me diligently will find me. Let me tell you what diligence is. I said this to my son years ago. I said, if I had a postcard, and on that postcard, I wrote a, a phrase, and that I told you that I placed this postcard in your bedroom. And then when you go and find this postcard, when you read it, it'll say, it'll say every person you love and every person you want to save. But you got to find it and you got to read it. I said, what would you do? I said, we're standing at the front door. I said, what would you do? He says, i go look for it. I said, okay, and you go up there and say, say you didn't find it today. Does it mean it's not there? He said, no, no. He says, it's, it's, you said it was there, so it's got to be in my room. I said, so what would you do? I keep looking for it. That's how important finding that card is. Well, he says, if you love my wisdom and you seek me diligently, you will find me. That's a promise. God says, if you seek me, you will not only find me, but you will also find the mind of Christ. And lastly, this is chapter 2 of Proverbs. It says this. The value of ways wisdom. It says, my son, if you receive my words, chapter 2 of Proverbs, my son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you so that the, uh, you incline your ear to wisdom, and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment, if you seek me, if you really want to know, he says, uh, and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her wisdom as silver and search for her wisdom as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. He says, valuable. I mean, uh, wisdom is more valuable than rubies. It's more valuable than material things. Because wisdom tells you how to live, how to grow. Amen? Amen. Seeking God will, uh, what is it? Seeking God um, oh, reveals the mind of Christ. Seeking God reveals the mind of Christ. Amen? Amen. Let us pray.